Hello, everybody. This is the public version of the Angel Investing 101 talk that I've given to several hundred Googlers. Um, so if you're looking for information about how you can become an angel investor and some pros and cons and concerns and all that jazz, then you are in the right place. Um, so a couple things before we begin. Uh, I am not a lawyer, so none of what you're going to hear today is legal advice. I'm also not qualified to give you financial planning advice, so please don't follow up to watching this asking me any legal questions or financial ad uh, advisory questions because I won't be able to answer those for you. I'm just some guy. You actually need to talk to a lawyer to get legal advice. There may also be some material errors in this presentation. I've tried my best to make sure that everything that's in here is true and correct, but I am mortal and do make mistakes. So if you find a mistake, please do let me know and please do uh, validate, verify anything that you hear in this presentation that you think is interesting uh, or perhaps objectionable. It goes without saying that angel investing is super, super risky stuff. So you ne definitely should never invest money that you can't afford to lose um, because it's going to be really illiquid and we're going to get more into that later. And then finally, this is the first time that I've done this presentation publicly. So if you have feedback on ways that this presentation could be improved, I would love to hear it. Thank you. Cool. So who is this for? So this course in particular is for accredited investors, and we'll get to exactly what that means, who are investing in early stage privately head, held US incorporated tech startups. And that's a lot of qualifications. If you're looking to invest in your cousin Vinny's pizza shop in Italy, then I really can't help you and this presentation isn't gonna be helpful for you. You should probably just stop. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about involves uh, U.S. securities regulation, and what kind of uh, expectations, definitions, etc. Um, so a lot of this is really specific to the United States. Um, cool. So uh, as a bit of pre-work, if you haven't yet read my guide to stock and options, uh, I'm going to ask you to pretty please uh, hit pause on the video right now and go read it. It's free. It's written in plain English, it's about 20 pages long, and it'll provide a lot of the definitions of the terms that I'm gonna use here. Read the third edition, cool. I'll try to leave a link uh, wherever I post this video, probably on YouTube or something. Cool, all right. Uh, some of what we're gonna cover today is some cautions and definitions of key terms. Again, hopefully you already read the uh, guide to stock and options. We're gonna talk a little bit about venture capital. Uh, how venture capital is structured and how VCs get returns. How do they get paid? We're going to talk a little bit about angels, angel groups, angelists, and syndicates. We're going to talk a little bit about crowdfunding. I'm generally um, going to point out where that makes sense and not uh, deal flow. And then how to be a great or a terrible angel investor. Cool. Some things that we're not going to talk about. It's not meant to be broad scale uh, financial planning and retirable, uh, re retirement planning. Um, we're also not going to talk about some of the fancier things that you can do with private equity, like variable prepaid forward options. Um, probably want to talk to a sophisticated financial advisor to figure out how to do stuff like that. Uh, very importantly, for a lot of you who are likely watching this, uh, you may not fall under the definition of accredited investor. And the advice that I'm going to give here is very targeted toward uh, investing as an accredited investor. Now, the good news is there are some options for the unaccredited investor under the JOBS Act. And there are websites like Seed Invest that can let you participate in, uh, in funding. There's also things like Kickstarter, obviously, although you, that doesn't make you an equity owner, so you don't have as much of the upside, but you may get a cool gadget out of it. Um, but this presentation is not focused on that. Um, maybe we'll do a different presentation later when I get more material on that. Um, and then we're also not going to talk about how to structure advisory agreements. I do have a lot of opinions about that. So uh, if you have questions about formally becoming an advisor of a company, I'm happy to provide some, uh, some input to you. It's also not about how to actually do a startup, how to start your company, how to hire good people or any of that. Super interesting topic, a lot of material there, and not going to cover it in this deck. So a really important uh, thing to distinguish here is what is the difference between a startup and a small business? A lot of people confuse these two. Uh, I feel like Steve Blank and Eric Reese have done a lot to help people understand that these are different concepts. 
So a startup is really a, a new endeavor to go and swing for the fences. It'll almost certainly fail. Most startups do. Um, but if it does hit it, it can hit it really big. It can hit it at scale. So you're generally going for a total addressable market that's very large on the order of billions of dollars if it's uh, ultimately a success. And it's got high margins, right? So it's, it's not something like, um, like mining where the, the margins might be very thin, right? So the goal is to explore concepts that can get you to, to big, big scale, right? For a small business, um, like your cousin's pizzeria, uh, oftentimes the goal is financial independence or, or baseline uh, profitability so that the people who started it and can operate it um, can, make a, can make a good living. You know, there's a lot of companies that are out there that need to be started. There's a lot of great small business opportunities that will never be worth a billion dollars, but are probably still a great idea to do. You know, I had a pair of friends who ran a dating site about 20 years ago that turned off a couple million dollars of free cash flow. Um, they didn't really structure it in a way where they were going to take it to a billion dollars, but they had a lot of fun with it. They kind of tag teamed. Um, one would go and travel the world and have fun and the other person would go and run operations and pay themselves like a million dollar a year salary. So um, there's some fabulous outcomes that are possible with uh, small businesses. You know, I've actually had people leave Silicon Valley to go manage like their family's uh, chain of gas stations, which is surprisingly profitable. Um, probably not going to become a billion dollar company, but you can make a really, really good living out. So that's totally solid. Um, but uh, there are much more limited uh, investing opportunities. The structure for how you want to invest in a small business is very different from the structure of how you want to invest in a startup. So we're going to focus on startups. Okay. Um, my background is I've started two companies. Uh, the first one, PB Wiki, was the first private wiki host on the internet. Uh, built that up to about 2 million groups, uh, serving about 4 million people a month. A uh, team of about 30 people raised almost $10 million of venture capital. That's actually still running independently today, uh, more than 10 years after I started it in my bedroom. Uh, second company got acquired by Facebook. I worked there for a bit. I worked as a product manager at Google for about four years, and I'm about to actually uh, leave Google and start my third company. Um, so I had a great time at Google, and it's time to go do another step. I'm actually doing this uh, video right now from literally my garage in Silicon Valley. So it's the most hilariously prototypical thing you could think of. I've also done a lot of investing in startups. So one of the things I really enjoyed as I became an entrepreneur was helping other people make different mistakes than the mistakes that I had made. Um, you're always going to make mistakes. Stuff's always going to go wrong. The goal is not to avoid making any mistakes at all, because that's just not going to be possible. The goal is to make mistakes that you couldn't have seen coming, right? And so the goal in founder and investor education is to help you make surprising mistakes, right? That's the, that's the goal of, of most learning. So I found that as I became an entrepreneur, I was learning things, oftentimes the hard way, and wanted to pass the things I was learning on to other entrepreneurs so they could make different mistakes. Um, I then migrated from sort of being an informal advisor for a number of those startups, became a formal advisor. And then I got to the point financially where I could be an accredited investor and my advice could be coupled with checks. And it turns out that's a, a really nice thing to do for a company is to not just give them advice, but to also uh, give them some money. So um, I started the first Silicon Valley vehicle for investing in Mexican tech companies called Mexican.VC uh, back in 2010. Um, that now, as of late 2018, has returned uh, 11x cash on cash uh, for our investors, uh, which makes us technically the most successful uh, Mexican tech fund ever created. So that's pretty cool. And it's more successful than many uh, VC funds. It was a small fund, but um, saw a lot of success with that. I created the first vehicle for investing in drone companies uh, called Drone.PC. I've got over 100 accredited investors in there, and we've made a number of drone investments. And also created a vehicle called Neuron.VC to invest in early stage deep learning companies in 2016. Um, so I've advised a bunch of companies, a bunch of those have had big exits. I've read, I wrote the guide to stock and options for startups. So hopefully you, you did read that, um, as well as the mechanics of angelist syndicates, if that's something that you're interested in learning about, uh, after this presentation, feel free to um, go and read that. 
Um, started Hacker Dojo, uh, which is a large co-working space. Uh, it's a nonprofit. Uh, we've got uh, about 300 members in there now. It's where Pinterest got started, Pebble Watch, WordLens, a, a bunch of uh, really cool startups like that. Uh, and I've uh, actually, this slide's outdated. I've invested in over 60 startups now. Um, so I, this is all just to say, I really love startups. Uh, I've had some fair amount of surface area exposure, both as a founder and investor in helping startups and working with startups. So I, I care a lot about doing the right things by founders and uh, helping people with great ideas and great early promise go and uh, bring that to fruition. Cool. So you're watching this presumably because you'd like to be an angel uh, investor. Maybe it's because you want to understand how angel investors uh, think, uh, what motivates them, um, because you're looking to raise angel funding for your startup. Cool. So there's some good reasons and some bad reasons to be a, an angel. Um, some great reasons. One of the best reasons I've seen is that you've been involved with startups. You care a lot about startups. Um, they've done well by you and you want to pay it forward, right? So a lot of why Silicon Valley works so well is the culture that we have here is not transactional, right? It's not, hey, I'll help you if you can help me with this other thing. And some of that certainly happens, but an awful lot of it happens where people who have done well uh, pay it forward to go and help the, the new generation of people doing a startup uh, who then in turn pay it forward. And it's sort of, it's a, it's a hippie thing, but it's worked out incredibly well out here, right? So uh, it's great if you can give back to the startup community. It's also a lot of fun to be around entrepreneurs. These are people who are a little bit crazy because they believe that they can create something totally new and really big that uh, nobody else has been able to create. Uh, and that requires some, some hubris and a lot of energy. Uh, and it can be very exciting to be uh, around these folks, right? And so it just can be really fun to see how these people are seeing the world, how they're framing their ideas, um, and just how passionate they are about what they're working on. Um, it can be really interesting to see how different concepts in different industries are framed. How do people frame the, the problem? How do they frame the, the go-to-market and the strategy? Um, and so it can be a point of inspiration for you to think about how you want to frame your own startup ideas. Not to take other people's ideas, but to think about how to frame it. Uh, I first found out about some cool presentation techniques like Prezi.com when watching uh, startup pitches. And it was interesting to see that. I think it can also make sense for somebody who is accredited to consider setting apart uh, a small part of their net worth. Uh, generally, I would cap it at somewhere between 5 and 10%. Uh, in, in this asset category. Um, and we can talk about uh, what it looks like to build a portfolio in this uh, asset category, which is uh, early stage, highly illiquid investments, right? I wouldn't put most of my money in this, and I definitely wouldn't concentrate on just having, you know, one or two big bets. That's more like a lottery ticket. We'll get into that. So what are the right expectations? What's the right mentality to have when going into angel investing? So one of the most obvious ones is that most of the things that you invest in are, are going to fail. And a lot of the ones that you invest in that don't fail, that continue to run, you'll actually never see a return of, of your investment, right? So it's really only a handful of the companies that you invest in, a small fraction that uh, are gonna see interesting liquidity where you're going to get many times your, your money back. Um, and it can be incredibly difficult to predict which of those startups it's going to be. So uh, the advice I give to most people and the advice I've looked to follow myself is to, is to build a portfolio, right? Because if you have a large enough portfolio of startups uh, and you're doing a good job at uh, making good bets, then once you get up to about 30 or 40 startups, the odds that one of those that you've invested in ends up taking off uh, goes up quite a bit. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that some new angel investors assume that if they cut a check for a few thousand dollars um, and become a shareholder, that they'll have all sorts of visibility and control uh, into the company, that they can um, 
direct the board. They can go and have a board seat um, that they will get all sorts of, you know, shareholder rights. Then they can advise the CEO on what to do and what not to do. And most of that's bunk. You're going to have very, very little visibility or control into your investments, particularly if you invest through a uh, single purpose vehicle. So if you invest as part of a syndicate, uh, you yourself are not directly a shareholder of the company. And so you have very, very uh, few rights. Now that actually has some advantages because it means your arm's length from your investment. You don't have to anywhere uh, near as much worry about things like conflicts of interest because you have very little visibility, you have very little control. It's much more of a passive investment for you. The other upside of that is that it means you can make a lot of uh, small investments um, and your obligation to uh, stay carefully plugged in with those companies is very low. Now you can add value, you can sit down with those founders and help them, but you're, you're not obliged to in the same way that you would be if you were say a board member, you have a fiduciary duty to that company to stay really plugged in with what's happening and to be giving them good advice and guidance. It's worth noting that your, your investments are pretty much illiquid. Um, so if you change your mind, you, you, you cut a $10,000 check to, uh, to a company, and then two years later, um, you need to buy a new car and you really need that $10,000 back, you're not going to get it back. Um, so you have to understand that uh, even if the company does really, really well, you have no control around liquidity. Um, and, and you'll have very few options uh, around timing when you can make those investments liquid. And so when you cut a check to a startup, you have to understand that it's going to be a long time, even if the company is successful, uh, until you, you see any of that cash back, right? And so th this is a really illiquid part of your portfolio. It's even less liquid than, uh, than, than real estate, right? Because it's very difficult to securitize debt around it. So you can't do like a home equity line of credit uh, equivalent for stock until the stock becomes worth a whole lot. Once the, once the stock that you're sitting on becomes worth a whole lot, there's other things like secondary markets and so forth. But for the vast majority of the angel investments that you're going to do, you're not going to be able to get any liquidity on them at all. And this is actually particularly true of the startups that do really, really well, which is a little surprising to some people, is that um, the median time in liquidity, you're looking at nine, 10 years. Uh, so if you invest in a company that does very, very well, you might have huge paper gains and you're thinking, oh, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. Um, that company could go to zero with no uh, liquid returns to you, or it, it could end up doing very, very well, but it's going to be a decade until you get paid back. So the right mentality going into this is really that you're going to cut a bunch of small checks. Most of those are going to go to zero. The ones that don't go to zero are going to take a, over a decade to go and pay you back, right? So this is a really patient game you need to play here. This is not how to get rich quick. If you wanna get rich quick, uh, first off, you're probably doing it wrong and you're looking for scams and, and B, uh, you probably shouldn't be an angel investor because it's not a uh, great way to, to get rich quick. It's a very patient game. Um, it's also very much subject to power law uh, returns, right? So the investment that does really, really well will probably do more than 10 times better than the investment that does pretty well, which will probably do 10 times better than your third place investment, right? So you get this crazy power law. So um, the goal is not to have most of your startups do well. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice, but, but you should be aware that the returns will come from having that equity in that one company that really go, goes to the moon. So one of your uh, main goals is to not have adverse selection bias, is to make sure that the pool of startups you're investing in uh, are likely to contain companies that could go to a billion dollars, right? And then to make a bunch of those uh, bets spread out over a portfolio. Um, so that's why you wanna diversify, cut a lot of small checks. So I'm gonna share some cautions, definitions, and risks. So the first one, it, it bears saying that most VCs uh, failed to beat the market. So if you take a look at uh, an ETF that tracks the overall markets like IYY, uh, it's super hard to beat the markets. And the vast majority of venture capital firms uh, failed to build a fund that could beat uh, IYY. It's a really, really tough uh, bit of competition. Keep in mind, these people are professionals. They are, they are paid very handsomely uh, to go and figure out what startups to invest in. And if this is your first time doing angel investing and you're doing it on the side, 
um, you're probably not going to do better than those full-time professionals, right? And, and so you, you might, right, you, you might strike it big, but the right mentality again here is that you should really enjoy the process of getting to know these startups, investing in them, helping people realize their dreams, right? It's a very satisfying process. And hey, if a whole bunch of money comes back, then that's great. That's, uh, that's awesome. If you have that mentality, you're going to have a wonderful time, right? If you really are fixated on like, I need to get uh, unbelievable returns, guaranteed returns, and I need to get my cash back quickly, this is the wrong path to go down. So I told you at the start of the video that we were going to talk a little bit more about the definition of what is an accredited investor. Um, we're also going to talk about what is a qualified investor. And the SEC defines this. So if in the last two years you made more than $200,000 a year in reportable income, and this year you expect that you're going to make more than $200,000 and you're filing singly, um, so you're, you're not doing a joint tax filing with a the spouse, um, then congratulations, you're accredited. You don't have any tests to take. You don't have any form to fill out. You are an accredited investor. If you are filing jointly uh, with a spouse and you made uh, together over $300,000 in the last two years, and this year you expect to make over $300,000, then congratulations, you and your spouse are both accredited. Um, the third bar is that if you have a million dollars in investable assets, not including your primary residence, congratulations, you're accredited. And it doesn't matter if you're going to earn one dollar this year. If you've got a million bucks, uh, you're you're accredited, right? So these are the three different uh, bars for uh, becoming an accredited investor. And the reason why the SEC wanted to do this is that if you if you have this much money, if you have access to this kind of capital, you should have access to good advice, which is to say when some uh, young huckster shows up trying to pitch you his ridiculous Bitcoin startup and wants you to invest uh, the entirety of your life savings, you should have access to financial advisors and resources like this video um, that give you the ability to say, no, that's a terrible idea, right? Um, so as you become more wealthy, the SEC will reduce its protections of you because you should have known better, right? Uh, a lot of why the SEC exists is to uh, protect uh, innocent people, particularly innocent poor people from getting bilked, right? From getting uh, talked out of uh, their retirement savings by uh, slick willies, right? Who don't actually have a real company there. And those people couldn't have known better because they're not wealthy and they don't have access to wealth advisors and the like, right? So um, there is a second bar you should know about, uh, which is that if you have over $5 million in assets, uh, also not including your primary residence, then you are a qualified purchaser. And the good news is that um, that's the nicest tier of investor to be from a startup's perspective, um, because they basically are unrestricted in how many qualified purchasers uh, there can be of their company stock. There, there are some limits around how many accredited investors they can have. Um, and things get super awkward uh, to have unaccredited investors. It's a very small number of those. And you basically have to prove that you're friends and family. And this wasn't as a result of some public solicitation. But like I said, I'm going to keep this presentation focused on accredited investors. So I'm going to be assuming that you, uh, the watcher of this video, are an accredited investor. Right. So if you're not accredited, you may not be able to do these kinds of startup investments yet. So um, work hard, go make some more money and become an accredited investor. And then you can uh, come back and rewatch this video. New as of 2016 is a very poorly framed uh, additional restriction um, that they want people to be a sophisticated uh, in investor. Right. Um, and in this case, you have to demonstrate that you are in a position to critically evaluate startup pitches um, and not just be uh, able to be suckered into things effectively. So um, the definition around what constitutes a sophisticated investor uh, wasn't put in clear terms by the SEC. Um, but the way that a lot of platforms like AngelList are interpreting this is if you've made other startup investments, if you've participated in a number of syndicates, if you've advised uh, a bunch of startups. Um, and so this has added a little bit of extra friction for 
new accredited investors who don't have any history with startups, like if they were just uh, an employee of Google or Facebook uh, whose stock had done really well um, and suddenly were, were rich but had no context for evaluating startup deals, that the SEC was a little shy about those people just throwing huge sums of money at uh, random startup pitches. Um, so you do have to demonstrate that you have a degree of sophistication. Um, and so Angelus, for instance, you need to say, um, what is your basis for believing that you are a sophisticated investor? Uh, and it's worth mentioning that uh, taking this class, telling people that you took this class, that you watched this video, um, is one component of what can lead a platform like Angelus to indicate that you are indeed a sophisticated investor. Cool. What are some risks that angels face when investing? Well, a big one is dilution. And what a lot of new investors don't realize is that uh, the stake that they own in a company, uh, certainly as a percentage basis, is going to continue to go down over time, uh, even if the company does really, really well. Um, and where things can get very unintuitive is that if a company has a flat round where its value is, it stays the same, right, from one uh, fundraising round to the next, that that can actually cause very significant dilution to early investors. And so you, you run into, uh, what, again, what can be a very unintuitive case where you got in very early in, into a company, the company had a big up round. Um, so on paper, you're looking like you're sitting on some pretty returns and then had a had a flat round because the company took longer to come to fruition than expected um, and then sold for a whole bunch of money. And you'd think like, okay, well, I'm going to make a lot of money here. And it could actually be the case that you make very little money because in that flat round, um, the uh, early shares got very heavily diluted uh, because the company needed to uh, create a whole bunch of, of new shares, right? Um, so it's just something that you need to watch out for is that the, generally the only way that an angel is going to make a lot of money is if the company ends up having a liquidity event that's much higher than the uh, value the company was at the point in time that the angel investor invested and uh, that value curve has been sharply up and to the right and monotonic. That it hasn't been um, it, it's super monotonic. It, it hasn't only been uh, flat and definitely hasn't gone down at all. A down round can result in what's called a recapitalization, which is basically where the new investors and the prior um, majority investors sit down and they agree on what the capitalization table should look like. And I can pretty much guarantee you that if you are a former founder, an early ex-employee, or a early angel investor, you're not going to have a seat at the table and you're going to be the first people thrown under the bus. Um, so it's just, it's a risk factor. And it can be a little disappointing if one of your investments ends up doing really, really well and you don't share in the upside there. But it but it happens. So just uh, just want to call it out. Um, Another thing that you have to watch out for is particularly if you've invested in a pretty early stage company in a somewhat risky market, but the employees, the founders and, and early hires are super smart, are, are obviously rock stars, is that uh, a company can come in and uh, acquire the talent. And this is called an aqua hire. And it's a little bit different legally than an acquisition because the acquiring company isn't actually acquiring um, the, the startup. They're acquiring the employees of the startup and they leave the startup entity as is and they leave it separate. And in these cases, it means that it's basically up to the management of the startup, um, the degree to which they want to split the proceeds from uh, th their own people, the employees, and the early investors. And there's really, in this case, there's very little power that you have as an angel investor to force the founder to uh, allocate a lot of that capital to the early investors. So it just has to be done in good faith. And I think this is one of the important reasons for um, yourself as an angel investor acting in good faith is that if you do your best to take care of your startups, your startups will do their best to take care of you. Um, so actually just last week, I had a case where one of my startups did have uh, an aqua hire and um, they had offers where they could have thrown us under the bus and basically returned nothing to investors. Uh, and the, and the founders 
um, just out of the goodness of their heart, went to bat for the early investors and got us a return. And that kind of came out of their pocket, right? And so it's a really meaningful gesture. But you should be aware that um, that is really up to the CEO. And so you need to make a judgment call as an investor, whether you think the uh, the, the founders, the management of the startups are going to have your back. And one of the best ways to guarantee that is to make sure that they know that you have their back. Uh, another risk factor here is what's called carve outs. So if a company is doing okay, but not great, um, I, I can get into the to the math over email if you're interested, but you can get into a position where the management would uh, isn't particularly incented to sell, even if it could uh, produce somewhat of a return for the in investors. And if the investors want to make sure that that's an option that's on the table, they can carve out um, some acquisition capital that goes to management that otherwise would have just gone to investors. And that can produce some extra incentive for uh, the management of a company that's doing OK, but not great uh, to be able to sell because management will get something out of it. The downside of that is it can be a little dirty because the management team might get a bunch of money, but the, uh, the, the employees, uh, even the early employees, might not get anything, and uh, certainly the other uh, early investors uh, may end up wiped out. Right, so it's not a it's not a great situation to be in. But generally, you're not really in a position where you're discussing things like carve outs unless things aren't going great. Right, so but this is just another risk factor in terms of where you, as an early stage uh, angel investor, may end up not seeing returns or see very insubstantial returns with pennies on the dollar, uh, even when the company uh, exits and gets liquidity for an amount that sounds very large, like dozens of millions of dollars. So uh, I talked about earlier how the likely case for a startup is that the startup will fail. Um, there's lots of reasons why startups fail, and I, I can't produce a, a full list, but certainly one of the most common reasons why startups fail is they build something that it turns out nobody wanted. A lot of people who are starting a company assume that uh, technical risk is a big one, that um, they just weren't able to figure out the, the really core technical challenges. And it turns out that that one's kind of rare. The bigger challenge is that you figure out how to solve the technical problems and you build this thing, you build this contraption, the service, and nobody wants it or not an interesting number of people want it. And they couldn't figure out how to uh, build something that people wanted. Right. So it's called product, product market fit. And so if you read books like The Lean Startup by Eric Ries, it'll teach you about how to very efficiently run these uh, rapid iteration cycles where you come up with a, a hypothesis, you build a prototype, you validate the prototype, and you learn what part of this do people actually want or not, right? Because you want to focus on de-risking the most likely thing to kill a startup, which is that you're building something that nobody wants, right? Um, another way that companies fail, even if they build something that people do want, is they build uh, what I call a money losing machine, right? And a money, uh, every business is a money printing machine. It's actually an important thing to realize. Every business is a money printing machine, right? If you put in a dollar, the business is going to go and churn on that for some period of time. It is going to spit out some amount of return on that invested capital, right? Um, in the case of a service business, like, for instance, a classic dot-com bomb uh, called Pets.com, uh, basically fex, FedExed pet, pet food to people. And, and if I recall correctly, they did it for free. Um, and so they would, uh, they would spend a lot of money to acquire the pet food and FedEx it to people's doors. Uh, and then they would get paid an amount that didn't cover that. And so as they scaled up, they continued to have a model where they put in a dollar and they got 80 cents out. And putting in more dollars into a machine like that is actually not a helpful exercise. You will just lose more dollars, right? Um, so you need a, a business model where your customer acquisition cost, the cost to acquire that customer and service that customer, is going to be less than um, the lifetime value of, of a customer. So you need to have the... Uh, customer acquisition costs be below the lifetime value of the customer. It's the definition of a good business. And ideally, it can go and return that money in a short period of time, right? So bad model is uh, is a big one. So you have to look at what what is it going to cost you to acquire a customer, to service that customer? And then when do you get paid by the customer? How long does that take to realize that, that revenue? And that'll define the startup's money printing machine. So 
Uh, this actually kind of happened in my second startup that I exited to Facebook as an aqua hire, which we talked about, uh, was that we, we had a, a great product. We validated that people actually really wanted this product, but it didn't have a good business model. It was going to cost us more to acquire customers and service them than we were going to get paid in any sort of reasonable time period. So we shut that business down. Um, a common one that uh, startups run into especially here in Silicon Valley, where a great founder has a lot of options, is just founder exhaustion, right? So people get tired of working for no or little pay. They get tired of long hours. Um, and they, <clears throat> they, they see their friends who are working at uh, great companies like you know, Google, like Facebook, like Apple, like Amazon, getting paid a lot of money, working 35, 40, maybe 45 hour work weeks, but not 100 hour work weeks. And um, that, that can be very attractive. And so people can just tap out. Major life events like uh, getting married, having kids, uh, buying a home uh, can, can often be triggering here is like you, you now have a new nut uh, that you need to cover. You need to make more money. Um, and if you have the uncertainty of uh, a startup that you're running, um, that can really wear on people. So very common thing that you run into, founder exhaustion. Cash management is another big one, uh, is that people grow their spending faster than they're growing their revenue. So even for a company that's doing pretty well, if they don't manage their cash well, they can find themselves out of business. Um, this one can be pretty tragic. Uh, an especially tragic variant of this is with hardware startups where they need to pay uh, the, the factory where their devices are getting made, but they don't get paid by their downstreams uh, until like net 60. Right, so they've got this uh, window that can be a quarter long, where they're having to float uh, all of their their inventory, and so that you can run into success failures, where they get a sudden rush of orders. You know, their product was featured on Oprah or something. They have to fulfill a whole bunch of orders, and the company goes out of money as a result. Right, and so this is what happens if you don't manage your your cash well. Um, is that you end up some uh, you you end up in a in, in a position where even if you have a good theoretical business model and a great product market fit, you can still end up uh, going out of business. And then uh, finally, a lot of businesses sound great and sound like neat opportunities, and it turns out they're super interesting opportunities because they're illegal. Uh, and the reason why they don't have existing competitors in the space is that it's not a lawful space to be in. Um, so <laughs> this, this happens a fair amount. Um, so just make sure that um, the startups that you're investing in, the fundamental premise of what they're promising to do is legal to do. Um, and if it sounds a little weird or, or fishy to you, um, you may want to go and call your friendly uh, neighborhood lawyer. And I'm happy to provide you uh, with, with any intros if you want to go and talk to uh, some good lawyers. Some medium uh, risks. So these aren't things that kill most startups. That last page was uh, things that I would reasonably expect to kill a startup. These ones happen, but don't happen as often. So you got to watch out for them, but they're, they're not primary concerns. Um, so one is that uh, new institutional investors are often going to ask for certain degrees of corporate control. They're going to ask for a seat, maybe even two seats on the board. They're going to ask for uh, special voting rights to be attached to their preferred shares. And uh, as these things happen, the, the founders can find themselves not in control of the company. And if you have an activist board that's really trying to shape the company, um, th th this can end up uh, kind of nuking a company because... Uh, a lot of investors believe that they could run a company better than the founding CEO. Uh, they want to bring in adult supervision. And the the data, weirdly enough, there's one of these things where you see VCs uh, do this all the time, and the data don't support uh, these actions, that founding C CEOs get uh, disproportionately better returns than investor-placed CEOs. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> if the founding team doesn't manage uh, their uh, control of their corporation, uh, investors can take over and then fire the CEO. And sometimes that can be a very surprising event for uh, a founder CEO to get fired from the company that they built uh, in, in their bedroom, in their garage. And there are tools that they can use to help prevent this from happening. Uh, generally speaking, you've got more powers to negotiate uh, board control and things like that. Uh, if the company is doing really, really well and you have a lot of options of term sheets, you can negotiate a lot of those things down or out. Um, and it's going to be in the early investors' best interest generally to, to support the founding team because you're going to get better returns that way. 
Uh, it's worth mentioning, particularly given the current administration, that visa issues are, uh, are a thing, uh, particularly if you're talking about foreign founders that are coming here to the U.S. to start a company. About 40 percent of Silicon Valley startups were founded by people who uh, are, were not American, who are not born here. Um, and uh, sometimes that can be an issue and they can be forced out of the country, which can pose risk for the startups that they've created here. This happened with one of the very early stage startups that I invested in. Uh, one of the two co-founders was Lithuanian. His visa expired and, and he had to go back to Lithuania and build the company from there. His co-founder, who is uh, Alaskan, ended up quitting. And it was a hugely trying time uh, for them. But he managed to you know, keep on plugging away and run it from Lithuania and the company's doing pretty well. Um, so you definitely want to look for grit like that in the founders that you're backing. Infighting is another one. It's really hard to start a company. There's going to be a lot of emotional highs and lows. And if you have a, a co-founder, um, that can often uh, lead to a very contentious relationship, right? You may need, uh, you know, one of your founders may need to fire one of the other co-founders. And that can be uh, a big enough deal emotionally, particularly if the two were very, very close friends, um, that both parties can decide that this company is not worth running anymore, or one of the parties uh, could have, you know, both of the parties could have been critical to the correct functioning of the startup. And if uh, one of them needs to go, then the startup's not viable anymore. This does happen. Talent is a really hard one. Uh, here in Silicon Valley, you've got lots of talent, but that talent is generally gainfully employed. Um, they're being paid really well. They've got great benefits. You've got really tough competition from the, the other companies that are out here. And so you can end up uh, totally starved for talent, surrounded by talent. Um, it's, it's telling me that even Google has got thousands of open job racks here in Silicon Valley. So uh, in, in a case where almost cost is no object, uh, you still can't get enough talent. You know, Google is starving for talent. Um, startups find themselves in a really hard position, particularly when it comes to early hires. So getting uh, employee number seven, employee number eight on board is super hard because on the one hand, they don't have enough uh, equity uh, on the cap table and the future cap table build out to be able to give single points, to be able to give, you know, three, four, five percent to an early uh, engineering hire. But at the same time, they don't have enough cash on hand to be able to pay competitively with the liquid total comp that a even a, an engineering new grad can expect out here in Silicon Valley. In some, in some cases, we're seeing companies paying over $200,000 a year total comp for people who are fresh out of college with an engineering degree and, and who totally aced their interviews. So it's really hard to compete with that. <clears throat> Conversely, if you go elsewhere, if you start a startup in the middle of the cornfields in Iowa, you'll be able to pay a lot less for talent. The talent that you find you'll be able to retain for much longer, but there may be a limited pool of it unless you've got uh, special access to um, local computer scientists and the like. But this is a common thing that will kill a startup is just that they, um, they they won't be able to get the talent they need when they need it, and they won't be able to retain it for long enough. That talent gets poached, walks out the door, et cetera. Another semi-common failure mode here is uh, is a zombie startup. And this kind of happened with my first company, with PBWiki, where we got to a point where we were making millions of dollars a year in revenue. It was more than a lemonade stand, but it was also less than an empire, um, where the, the margins weren't incredible. And so as a result, we ended up dominating the private hosted wiki space, but uh, we, had, we had trouble pivoting that to become a multi-billion dollar you know, cloud company like Box or Dropbox or Google Drive have, have become. And so it didn't make sense to turn it off because it was still serving millions of people, still making millions of dollars, but it was really hard to keep it on as well. Just the economics weren't working, right? So <clears throat> you end up sort of putting it into a, maintenance mode, a steady state. Um, and that's not going to get very attractive returns for the uh, for the early stage investors. Right. So some things that people worry about, but don't actually happen all that often. Um, a lot of first time investors in particular get very nervous that they're going to uh, end up collectively cutting uh, checks for hundreds of thousands of dollars to first time entrepreneurs, that those people are just going to uh, ghost and they're going to split town and, and, and retire in the Caribbean. And one thing that certainly helps that is that seed rounds tend to be a lot smaller. You're putting together an angel round, it's gonna be two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. That's not worth going and having the FBI running after you, right? Um, 
And, and, and so I just, I actually have, have basically never seen this where a seed investment I've done has had uh, somebody try and, and, and run away with uh, the, the money. I have had one company I advised where the, the founder did some really dumb things like uh, bought a, an Escalade in, 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 in cash to use as a company vehicle um, and then just used it to drive to parties. Terrible idea. That was on like a $300,000 round. Terrible idea. Um, but just in terms of outright fraud, uh, in that sense, it it, it, it happens. Um, uh, one of the companies I invested in Mexico, and uh, sadly, uh, ended up that uh, the the back office was 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 mostly fraudulent. We only found out about it after we got a notice from this from the uh, a replacing interim CEO that the company was shutting down. Um, so we didn't see that one coming. It does happen, but um, this is much lower risk. So this is on the order of like 1% of the companies that you invest in. Um, so just, I, I wouldn't be super concerned about it. Um, in terms of IP, you know, people are sometimes concerned that they'll be sued by a big company. Most of the large companies have very large uh, and very exciting uh, patent portfolios, but these are defensive portfolios. They don't generally use them to uh, attack a startup. It's, it's bad for press, it's bad for business for them. And they're not going to be able to recover very much capital from the, um, from the startup. It's the same thing for uh, patent trolls. Um, you know, certainly when I was doing my first startup, PBWiki, we got notices from patent trolls, but we didn't actually have enough capital um, to be worth going after because uh, going after a patent case requires hiring a patent attorney and patent attorneys get paid a whole lot of money, right? And so, uh, that means it's very expensive to defend a patent case, but it also means it's very expensive to to litigate a patent case. So folks aren't going to come after you until it's pretty obvious that you've got a lot of capital, and that's going to happen in uh, in a later stage. It's it's somewhat rarer for a very early stage startup to just get nuked from orbit uh, by a, by a big patent case. It happens, but it's much lower risk. Um, then another thing that a lot of first time founders worry uh, about, spend a lot of time, probably too much time worrying about, is that somebody's just going to grab their idea and run with it. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, if you had the idea, if you had the energy and the passion to understand the customers, to go and build out the first order solution, then that is actually the part that's super hard to replicate. And oftentimes the idea itself is worth a lot less than the founder imagines. Now, I have some sympathy for the founder because uh, most of what they have at that very early stage is the idea. And so it has to seem to them valuable. Otherwise, they have to come to uh, <laughs> reckon with the fact that they have very little of value. But I like to tell people, if you had gone back to the mid 80s and um, whispered in somebody's ear, hey, you should sell books online. Um, would that have let you build Amazon if you said, uh, hey, you should do auctions online? Uh, would that have let you build eBay? Uh, you should let people pay each other money. Would that let you build PayPal? Not really. In, in these cases, the, the idea was interesting, but effectively all of the value that was created was in the IP that got built in actually executing the idea. So uh, the, the idea just by itself isn't generally going to be particularly valuable. There are a handful of fields where that is not true. Um, that includes uh, like chemistry, where a particular chemical formulation um, can be the result of uh, years of trial and error and could be pretty quickly reproduced by a large competitor. And so there's a couple areas where uh, patents and trade secrets can help a startup a whole lot. But for a consumer tech startup, generally the concept itself is, is not particularly valuable. And so theft ends up not being uh, that big a risk. In terms of VCs now, um, what are VCs, how do they get paid, and how does that affect how you as the angel investor should be thinking about your investments, right? Because oftentimes there's a mental model, which is that somebody in a garage, kind of like this garage, has an idea, starts building something out, assembles a team, uh, pitches some angel investors, guts an angel round, makes some forward progress, closes some customers, raises a VC round, raises another VC round after making even more progress, raises another VC round after making even more progress, and then goes public or sells for hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, right? And then everybody gets paid and everybody's happy. Um, in that world, it's really helpful for you as the angel investor to be able to understand um, that next phase of investment, which is say the, the venture capital investor. So what is a VC? A lot of people assume it's just a set of individuals who are fabulously wealthy and cutting like giant multi-million dollar checks, which are mostly their own money. In most cases, that's not correct. 
VCs generally are investing other people's money. And so VCs have to fundraise themselves. So they go to folks who have even bigger pocketbooks, right? So folks like pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, uh, family offices, which is uh, basically private bankers for incredibly wealthy people. And they ask those folks for very large checks, you know, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars um, that they in turn are going to invest in startups, right? So they are kind of like a startup themselves is one way to, way to think about it. The people who are actually running the fund, the general partners, they put in about 1% of the fund's capital. So if you take a look at a typical mid-sized venture capital fund, uh, about $300 million, let's call it, the general partners put in $3 million of their own money, and they took $297 million of other people's money to go and invest in startups, right? Um, the folks who put in that uh, $297 million get very little say over what kinds of startups get invested in, or and they don't have any say at all about the individual startup investments. So they're called limited partners because they have a limited amount of control into what's getting invested in. There's an agreement called the Limited Partner Agreement, or LPA, between the uh, VC and the limited partners that says on what basis are they going to invest in startups and um, what's, what's their process, what's their procedure, when do they pay out all of that. Um, most venture capital funds are raised for a 10-year period, and the goal is to make investments out of that fund in the first few years of the fund, generally the first three, maybe four years of a fund. Um, they're, they're going to be finding uh, new startups to invest in and cutting them checks. And they won't actually spend down the full amount of the fund, even though they're done making new investments in the first couple of years, because they keep aside some dry powder, oftentimes a half of the total amount in the fund, uh, to go and do follow-on investments, to be able to lead follow-on rounds, to be able to maintain their pro rata in companies that are doing well, etc. And so you might ask, well, what happens in year five when they find a cool new company they want to invest in if they're not investing uh, in new companies out of that fund anymore? And the answer is overlapping funds. So usually um, they'll want to close. So fund one lasts for 10 years because most of these funds last for 10 years. And then they'll start fund two. Um, they'll cl want to close that about three years into fund one. Right. And then three years after fund two starts, they're going to want to go and raise for fund three, fund four, uh, and so on and so forth. Right. And so you've got a bunch of these different overlapping uh, funds. Right. So how are VCs paid? How do they make their money? And the typical way uh, can vary from fund to fund, but um, most commonly what you'll see is a scheme called two and 20. And this is where 2% of the assets under management are paid out to the VCs who are managing that capital. Right. So if you have, again, a $300 million fund, a typical mid-sized VC fund, $6 million a year is getting paid out to go and operate the fund. Now that has to cover legal, back office, accounting, auditing, um, and VC salaries. But if you have a partnership with five or six partners, um, that's six million bucks a year just for managing the portfolio independently of the portfolio's performance is a pretty good deal. And some LPs have said that's actually too good a deal. And I, I want you to have more skin in the game and either increase your 1% your that you're putting in uh, as the GPs or decrease that management fee uh, from 2% because that ends up eating into returns pretty, pretty substantially. And especially true of funds that fail to beat the market. Like you're paying 2% on that $300 million and the liquidity returns that you're getting back are less than what they'd get when invested in uh, just like in, in NASDAQ ETF, right? Um, so th there's been some uh, recent pushback by LPs to try and uh, lower that uh, figure a bit from, from 2%. Um, and, the, and what is the 20? The well, 20% is what's called carry. And this is basically the profit that the fund makes. So when the, the fund goes and, and collects the, the money from LPs in, in a set of tranches, these are called capital car calls, where the LP has committed to investing money into the into the VC, um, the the firm can then request uh, certain tranches of that money be wired into in, into the firm for purposes of investing, right? And so we'll, we'll do a capital call. They'll go and make investments in startups, and then over time, hopefully. 
the name of the game is that some of those startups ends up, end up uh, returning liquidity. And when that happens, the first thing that happens <coughs> is that the limited partners get paid back their capital, right? So the $300 million um, gets paid back to, to the LPs um, with, with no further uh, amounts taken out of that. Now for liquidity that's beyond that, let's say the fund returned six, $600 million, right? Had $600 million of liquidity. Well, the first thing that happens is the $300 million get, dollars gets returned, which now leaves $300 million remaining in profit, right? And that $300 million of profit, 20% of that, or $60 million, would get paid out effectively as a big fat bonus uh, to, the, to the VCs, to the partners, right? And this is in theory where being a VC makes you lots of money is, is being able to pick deals that get a huge amount of liquidity leveraged with other people's money, and then you get 20% of the profits, right? So this is, in, this is where as a VC, you can make a huge amount of money. But like I mentioned in the earlier part of the deck, it can take like a decade to actually realize those returns. So being a VC is also a very patient game. It just, it, it, it helps with the patients when you are getting paid a 2% management fee too, right? So, um, so they, they get paid this 20% carry. Now, the really important part here to notice is that they only get paid that carry once they've returned the fund. It is not on a per deal basis. So let's say a VC invests $3 million in a, in, a, in a very small Series A that's going into a startup. And the startup does, from the startup's perspective, super, super well and exits for 10 times the valuation uh, after a year, right? Now, you might be thinking as a retail investor, is just you know a regular angel investor, wow, 10x my money back in one year. That's unbelievable. I would love to get an investment like that. That would be incredible. And the surprising part is it's not actually all that attractive for the VC. And this is what gets a lot of people. And this is why a lot of people get very confused about how VCs operate. Is because for a VC in a $300 million fund that cut a $3 million check that then turned into $30 million of liquidity, they have to return their fund. They still have $270 million left that they need to return before they're going to get paid any of that carry. So none of that $30 million actually goes back to the VC. Right, and and this is this is where people get really surprised because they'll go and pitch a VC with uh, maybe even a very low risk deal where the the founder is absolutely convinced and can present good data that if you invest three million dollars in my company that I can make that worth thirty million dollars in a year and give you liquidity. Like, hey, you're an investor. Doesn't that sound like a very in attractive investment proposition? And the VC will say, nope, I'm going to pass. And 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 the founder is so confused, like. Why are these VCs turning down this deal that could make them 10x their money in a year? And the answer is because that's not how the VC gets paid, right? And so that's why this slide is really important in understanding what kinds of deals are going to be attractive to VCs. Now, you'll notice <clears throat> this doesn't line up with what are all attractive businesses. A lot of people in Silicon Valley in particular feel the need for their startup to be validated by receiving a venture capital round. But the truth is, if you get a VC round, that just means that the VC thinks that there's some chance, it can be slim, but there's some chance that you're going to be worth many billions of dollars. As the founder, that may actually not be uh, an ends that you're uh, th that is very attractive. As a founder, what you may want is a lower risk opportunity for you to make many million millions of dollars, right? So when you go from having $20,000 in your bank account to having $2 million in your bank account, that's life changing, right? So your interests, especially as a first time founder and, uh, and, and, and as an angel investor may not be aligned with a VC's interests, right? So the, the thing to remember is, a, is an angel investor here is that you do care about the internal realized rate of return, the IRR, right? <clears throat> and a deal that could return you 10x cash on cash within one year. First off, I'd be a little skeptical of the pitch, right? Because it sounds too good to be true, so it probably is. But if you are actually able to realize that, if you're actually able to get 10x cash on cash on one of your deals, it's going to be great for you, right? So there may be certain deals that make a lot of sense for angel investment that don't make any sense at all for VCs. This also serves to explain a common critique people have of venture capital, where they say, um, I don't get why these VCs only want 
deals that could potentially be worth billions of dollars, right? I don't get why my VCs keep on pressuring me uh, to build this business and to take really big risky moves to build this business into something that could be worth a billion dollars. And the answer is that's the only way they get paid, right? <laughs> so keep that in mind that, that that's, um, there's a very particular set of businesses for which a VC is a good idea. There's many other very attractive businesses uh, for which VC is not a good idea, but angel investment might be. Cool. So typical round sizes, looking at a few hundred thousand dollars for something that's passive. Generally, why don't I put something that's under a hundred thousand dollars? Well, in the U.S., credit is so uh, easy to come by for, for most people that, um, I mean, you, you get credit card offers in the mail like once a day, right? Um, that if you need uh, less than $100,000 of financing, you should probably just self-finance it. And if you're not willing to self-finance it, if you don't believe in yourself well enough to self-finance it, why should other people believe in you enough to, to finance your, 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 your company, right? So um, it's not common to see deals in the U.S., where you're raising less than hundred thousand dollars. Now, this story changes dramatically as you go uh, overseas. It's if you go if you go to other economies where getting personal credit is really hard. It's actually personal credit is crazy easy to get in the U.S. and can be super hard to get in other geographies. Um, in which case, twenty k, thirty k, fifty k checks can go a real long way in those places. But in the U.S., you're generally not going to see a deal less than a uh, hundred k. At the uh, 250K uh, size and up, you're, you're often seeing a seed round. This is usually done with a, a debt instrument, um, uh, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, although these terms vary wildly. I've seen people do a $10 million round where they'll, they'll call it a seed round, right? A $20 million financing, maybe a seed round. Like that has no legal meaning. So you can get to call a round whatever you want to call a round, right? But a series A would typically be for like two to $20 million. It'd be very rare for uh, somebody to invest $1 million or have a whole round be $1 million and call that a, a series A. Um, series B, series C, you can see the numbers here. Um, a lot of this is just like, what is industry convention? Uh, again, because Series A doesn't actually mean anything legally, uh, you could call it uh, Series My Foot, um, and that would be a, a binding instrument. So, um, so th this gets back to some points that I was trying to make about um, what kinds of businesses are VC investable. There's a lot of good businesses out there that are just utterly unattractive from a VC economics perspective. Um, doesn't mean that they're bad businesses. Um, so th th this is just uh, un underscoring some of the bits I was talking about. There are some new funds like 500 Startups uh, where they are trying to cut smaller checks earlier, uh, have it not come with a board seat so they can make a lot of investments, cut a lot of small checks. And um, and that does seem like it's, it's performing pretty well. Um, cool. So some, some tips when meeting with venture capitalists. Um, <coughs> Some, something that you want to be careful of is to pay attention to the job title of the person that you're meeting with at the VC firm. Um, so VCs often employ a bunch of people called associates. And these people's jobs are to scout deals, to see what's out there, and to report back to the partnership. Um, a lot of first-time founders won't realize that they're meeting with an associate. They assume everybody at the uh, VC firm is a partner uh, and could make a decision about whether or not to invest in a company. It's not true. Um, and associates often don't pull a lot of weight in terms of deciding what uh, what kind of deals get funded or not. That said, they can be a fabulous conduit in uh, to get you in front of a partner who ultimately will go to bat for you and help make the deal happen. Just be aware that when you're meeting with an associate, the goal of that meeting should be to find a to get a meeting with a partner, right? To get the attention of the partnership. Um, otherwise. Part of what might be going on is that folks may be just scouting. They may be about to invest in a competitor. Um, so you also need to uh, be thoughtful about what information you share. And when you do share information, you have to kind of assume that it's going to be uh, out there and your competitors are going to have access to it as well. Different partners meet on different days, but a lot of VC partnerships meet on Mondays. And so if a company gets asked to come in and present on a Monday, that's usually a good sign. It means they're going to go and uh, present to the full partnership. And oftentimes the decision about uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, whether they're going to invest or not is going to be made on the spot right after the, uh, after the pitch. Um, usually things go from kind of associate to a single partner meeting to a two partner meeting to go and vet. Um, 
sometimes there'll be um, a meaningful subset of the partnership of like three or four partners um, who then will go and do a final vetting before a full partner meeting. And then immediately after that is the go, no go. Um, so that's often the sequencing uh, to get to a term sheet from a VC. Uh, when you have a term sheet in hand, that term sheet often expires within 48 hours is pretty typical. Um, and once you sign it, they've got a no shop clause. And so you've, you've, you're making a commitment to move forward with uh, those terms when you go and sign a term sheet. Um, it can be another 30 to 60 days to close. That can be a big surprise to folks who haven't done a VC round before as they assume that when they sign the term sheet, money goes into the bank account and we're all done, right? And like, no, 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 you're actually, you've just kicked off uh, a one to two month process that's going to be very intensive where the VC firm now has the right to inspect everything you've done, all of the lines of source, all of the contractor agreements and IP agreements, uh, all the open source that you've used, um, uh, all of your employment agreements, uh, all of your bank statements, right? Um, it's, 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 it can be a pretty exhaustive diligence that they're doing to make sure that your company is real and they're not getting scammed, right? Um, so that process of pitching VCs um, can take a couple months to go and raise around in some cases over a year. Um, and that process of closing can take another one to two months. And in that time period, the founder is not really focused on, on growing the business. Fundraising and, and closing that round can be a full-time effort. So just something that you should be aware of as an angel investor is that uh, doing VC rounds can be, uh, take a lot of time. And so generally when you raise a uh, VC round or when you raise an angel round, you want to make sure the startup has got you know at least 18 months of runway where they can go and execute the company. They can really just focus on building the business for 12 months. And then uh, six months, uh, when six months of runway are left, they can shift into fundraising mode to, to, to raise and, and close the funds that they need. So uh, how are angel investor and investments structured? Well, a couple different uh, things to note here. Uh, first is around taxes. So <clears throat> when you make an angel investment, that actual act of investment itself is not a taxable event because you are receiving an instrument, generally either a debt or an equity instrument, in exchange for cash that you paid the company that is worth the same amount as the instrument. So it's not income to you, it's not a loss for you, it's a non-taxable event. If you hold on to uh, equity for less than 12 months and then sell it uh, for a gain, that short-term cap gains, which is treated same as income. Um, so that would, uh, if you're in the very highest uh, federal tax brackets, it's almost 40%. Um, if you're in the highest of California brackets, that's uh, actually now about 11% or so. Um, so basically half of that can go away. So short-term cap gains is, is, is pretty brutal. Um, if you hold that equity for more than 12 months, then you get treated under long-term cap gains in the highest federal bracket, that's 20%. Uh, California doesn't actually give special treatment for long-term cap gains, so you're similarly going to be taxed another 10, 11% there, but a substantially better uh, federal treatment. Most people know those two bits. Here's the part most people don't know is that if you invest in a U.S. corporation where as part of it, where it's a C corporation and the post money value of that corporation is under $50 million and you hang on to that equity for more than five years, you are subject to 0% capital gains uh, under qualified small business stock, right? Um, Super, super cool. So a lot of folks don't realize that there's actually, this was put into place to help you, the accredited in angel investor in US startups, uh, do your job and get paid better for doing your job and in investing in startups. So super cool. Um, one other really neat thing to note here is that if you are part of the first million dollars going into a, a QSBS and, and the company fails, <clears throat> you actually get to uh, deduct the amount that you invested uh, from your ordinary income under a section 1244 loss. Um, so super cool. Again, talk to your accountant, talk to your tax attorney. I'm not qualified to give you financial advice or practice tax law. Um, but these are some really neat advantages to uh, acquiring equity in a C corporation and holding it for a long period of time. Note that the, the these clocks, because all these are kind of time durations, only start running when you actually acquire equity. 
not when you get a convertible note, not when you acquire a safe note, right? So you actually have to be a shareholder in order to start the clock on these things. If you own debt and then the, the company gets acquired and you get uh, paid out a multiple of your debt, you know, plus some interest, um, uh, all that's going to be short-term cap gains, right? You're, you're not going to get a long-term cap gains treatment, even if you held on to that debt for like a decade, right? So this is only for equity. So it's one of the reasons why um, you do want to angle for uh, equity, all other things being, uh, being equal. Cool. So for a smaller round, oftentimes people don't invest uh, through equity. They invest uh, as debt using what's called a convertible note. So the goal of a convertible note is that you're going to make a loan to the company. You're going to give them some cash. And there's going to be a small token amount of interest, generally 4 to 6% uh, interest that comes along with that loan. And you never want to get repaid in cash uh, for, for the interest, right? The goal of making this investment is that it converts that total amount of debt that the company owns, uh, owes you in the company's next financing round converts into equity. And this has a couple advantages. One is that uh, debt instruments are super easy to uh, execute and to administer. It's generally one, two, maybe three pages, whereas a uh, uh, equity instrument can be substantially more complicated. It also lets you punt to a certain degree uh, the, the value of the company because you're saying, okay, I'm going to um, loan you this money plus this sort of very basic interest rate, and I want you to convert it at whatever the company is worth in the next round, minus some discount, right? Oftentimes a 20% discount is, 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 is pretty typical. Uh, or a cap. And what a cap is, is a cap says, um, let's say the company does really, really well, right? So I, I, I invest in it today, and in, in a couple of years, in, with that debt, the company makes it a couple of years and then raises a huge financing round, like where it values the company at like $100 million, right? If I loaned the company, uh, $100,000. And when I did that, I thought the company was worth maybe about a million dollars or so. I, I could end up really hosed if the company is uh, paying back my, my loan of $100,000 with interest. Even if I get a, a bit of a discount from the $100 million valuation, I end up owning a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the company, which isn't fair because I backed the company when it was a super early stage, right? So I'm generally not a fan of uncapped notes. But what a capped note will give you is that if the company's value in that next round is above a certain threshold number, you get to convert your debt as if the company was worth that, that lesser figure. Right. And so if I were to make a investment on a 20% discount and a $5 million cap of $100,000, you know, that's a, that's a 50th, that's 2% of the company. Um, this sort of is, is the smallest percentage that I end up owning, uh, e even if the company goes to the moon. Right. Um, so anyhow, just something to think about for, for you is generally um, you do want a, a capped note because an uncapped note can end up in this awkward scenario where um, the company becomes very, very valuable, um, but your, your, your ownership has become uh, kind of radically diluted. And it's, it's not really super fair to, to you as the investor, right? Um, so uh, this ends up meaning that uh, both capped and discounted note it ends up being a common form factor for uh, convertible notes. And uh, the funny part, of course, is that the cap that you set on the note is implicitly, effectively, the value you believe that the, the company has, right? And so part of why you do a convertible note is to avoid arguments about what the company is worth, but setting a cap sort of sets the worth of the company because it's setting a baseline in terms of the smallest percentage of the company that uh, you'd end up owning after the, the next round. So um, it, it effectively, one of the major reasons why they get done is that they're relatively easy to execute. But some of that has changed. So there are uh, other instruments that you can use. Uh, a safe note um, is, is another option that uh, doesn't have an expiry date. So one of the awkward bits about using a convertible note is that usually technically they expire after 12 or 24 months, at which point the note becomes due. Um, but that's awkward because the, the, the lender, the investor, doesn't actually want to get repaid cash. And um, they, they, they want to end up with ownership in the company. And the company often can't afford uh, to actually pay out in cash what, they, what, what was invested in them 12 or 24 months previously. So if you as the debt holder demanded repayment of the note, 
it, it would often put the startup out of business, right? Which is also not desirable because then you're basically not going to make almost any of your money back. So a safe note takes care of some of these concerns in terms of uh, removing that awkward date uh, on, on which a note is due and having to have a board approve doing note extensions and any of that. Um, however, I have heard some mixed uh, stories from uh, people getting uh, investors getting getting pushed out of rounds or uh, pretty radically diluted because a safe, a safe note doesn't come with very many protections. So my preferred note when I, when I can is to use just a boilerplate equity agreement, super boring. You're not trying to ask for any special privileges or rights, but to use something like a series seed. And the good news about that is that it's very easy to ex uh, execute, almost as easy to execute as a convertible note. Um, it's templated. Uh, generally, the uh, Startups Council will have seen this before, so it's not surprising, it's not weird, it's very easy for them to digest. So the closing can be very quick, and at the end of it, you end up with actual equity, right, which gives you uh, certain rights and privileges and also starts the clock running on long-term cap gains and the five-year QSBS, right? So if you can get equity, you should get equity and make it easy for the startup, use templated notes, etc. Cool. So some, some jargon that's used in doing financing rounds. So there's generally three different ways to do a round. So the most ideal is that there is what's called a lead. And a lead is generally cutting the biggest check, sometimes the majority of the capital, sometimes just the plurality. But um, this is generally the party that's cutting the largest check going into the round, um, who has invested in a bunch of other startups before and is therefore pretty well professionally qualified to be able to determine what attractive terms for the investment would look like, right? So this person goes and, and sets those terms, uh, agrees on them with management, and then lets other people join in on the deal on exactly the same terms that they got, right? And so that's really clear. So uh, an easy question to ask if you get approached by a company that's doing a financing round, you're having a conversation with them to say, who is your lead, right? Who is your lead investor? And a bad answer would be, uh, oh, it's my uh, uncle Harry who's going to put in $5,000 of this $5 million round. Like, not okay. But the lead investor actually has to have substantial skin in the game and should be professionally well qualified in order to set the terms of investment, right? Um, a follower is someone who's basically committed to following a, a, a round on the same terms as, as, as a professionally qualified lead. So what will often happen for a startup is that they'll go and pitch a bunch of venture capitalists and uh, some of those VCs will say, I I'm interested to participate. And the startup needs to understand that what they've just gotten is a soft commit for a follow. This uh, VC is not necessarily interested in, in, in leading the round. Um, so when negotiating the terms of a round, often there's what, what is the lead going to put in, but then what is the allocation? What's the total round size that's, that's being agreed to as part of this? And then other people can be invited into that allocation, right? Other people who would, would follow. <coughs> there are some early stage seed funds that mainly focus on, on following, not leading rounds. And so these can be very attractive for multiplying the capital that you get. So you might get um, a, a lead offer to put in uh, $3 million of a $5 million round. It means you have $2 million uh, that's open in your allocation and you can go and pull in uh, an, another entity that could go, this entity put, pulls in, uh, writes a $1 million check, this entity puts in a $500,000 check, and then you leave some space in for, for angels. So you, you've, you've got space for uh, $500,000 of angel investment. That would be a yeah, not terribly uncommon kind of uh, you know, seed round or, or early stage series A. Um, one practice that's not all that uncommon, but is uh, a little tougher as an investor is what's been uh, kind of called a party round. And this is where the management team says, we would like to raise $3 million on a $10 million valuation. And I think the fair question there is like, where'd you get the 10 million bucks? Does this sound nice? Do you just like, did you just... Uh, think that that would be a, a nice percentage to give away for a nice amount of money. Like the management team just kind of made it up and they're hoping some investors will bite on it. Um, and in some cases they'll put that out there and they'll get some followers, but the followers are investing conditional on finding a lead 
typically accepts those terms. So just something you should be aware of as an angel investor is that if a startup comes to you and says, oh, we're doing a $3 million round on a $10 million pre-money valuation, they may have just made that money up out of thin air and are trying to figure out if you're dumb enough to take it, right? Um, so it's always fair to ask, where did you get that valuation from? And a lot of times, particularly for a first time investor, uh, for a first time founder, the answer will be, well, we just felt like that was an appropriate valuation for the company. And it'll be up to you to decide whether you believe that or not. But generally speaking, you should have a professional investor who's setting the, the terms of the deal um, to, to, to minimize risk here for you. All right, so where do you get deals from? How do you find startups to invest in? So a couple different options. Um, ideally, people come to you or you know of, of founders, right? Uh, and a great way to do this is to be useful to startups. If you give people a lot of great advice, if you find ways to be really helpful, a lot of startups are going to want to connect with you. And founders tend to know other founders. So the karma bank is real. If you're out there helping people, creating value, founders are going to tell each other, you're going to have a lot of people who are coming to you asking for, for advice, right? And so building up your, your own brand to get direct sourcing is really great. Um, another way to go and get sourcing is, um, is to source deals is to join somebody's syndicate. So AngelList has a bunch of different syndicates and you can join one and you'll get access to all kinds of really interesting deals, right? Um, there are angel groups that are out there, um, like Kiretsu, Band of Angels, etc. The quality of these groups is pretty variable, generally pretty low. Um, and their business model is a little weird because they can charge angels to participate and they charge startups to pitch, um, which tends to lead to um, uh, bias, which tends to lead to the startups that are participating and the kind of angels that are participating as being uh, lower quality. And this is often where you'll find uh, sharks, right? So you'll find people who are uh, trying to pitch you um, very expensive professional services, right? Who are just basically trying to prey on uh, other angel investors uh, or trying to prey on unsuspecting first-time founders. Um, so I would generally stay, stay away from angel groups. Um, and then there are oftentimes incubators uh, that will have demo days. Um, and these can be fun to attend just to get a sense of what's out there, how are people pitching. Um, and so it, and, and, and part of it is they're hoping that you'll get excited enough to want to invest at the end of it. So I would recommend taking a peek at that. If you're a former Googler, the Zoogler.co um, group runs a regular set of demo days and also has an angel syndicate. It's so X O O G L E R.co. I don't actually have any formal uh, affiliation uh, with them. Just think they're cool. But that's one example. So some, some tips, um, if you're just going out there pretty generically, like I want to meet startups, you might actually have a really hard time of it. It's much better to look at your own personal brand, right? Did you go to uh, a university that where you're now in a different part of the country than that university is? And so uh, alumni who happen to be in your part of the country um, <clears throat> might want to uh, network. Right, and so can you facilitate that network? Can you facilitate um, uh, founders who are from that alma mater? Right? Are you from a country, and there's only a limited number of people from that from that country who are in your area? Can you go and gather those people together and do uh, help the startups from people who are from that country in in your area? Right? Is there a diff Is there a technical domain? Um, that you are very skilled in where you can provide very helpful advice and also will do a good job diligencing startups in that area. Find a place to plant your flag, right? And for uh, a certain set of startups, have you be an obvious first port of call for them, right? So when I started Drone.VC, there weren't any other drone investment vehicles. So pretty much all the early stage drone companies came to me. So they're like, hi, you're apparently a drone venture capitalist. It says so right on the door, drone.vc. So maybe, and I'm a drone company. Uh, so we should talk. So planting a flag in that really specific kind of a way is helpful. If I just said I'm a hardware venture capitalist, you know, the, the, the quality of the deal flow and the, and, and, and my ability to close those deals would have been a, a lot hampered. It was the, it was the fact that it could be really specific that I was going to invest in drone companies that really let me get high quality deal flow. Um, finally, you, you can actually find some very promising uh, latent deals just going and skimming through uh, AngelList, CrowdFunder, SeedInvest, uh, stuff like that. Um, 
so those, those are other ways to, to source. One thing a lot of people forget is they forget to tell their network. So you, you have friends on Facebook, you have friends on LinkedIn, you have people who follow you on LinkedIn, and those people may not realize that you're an investor. <coughs> those people may not realize that <coughs> you're looking to meet with promising startups. And if you just remind people somewhat regularly, you may find that your, your network can bring cool deals to you. So just don't, don't forget that you already have some powerful tools at your disposal. You can also reach out to your alumni office. Um, all right, cool. So a couple flags as you're trying to evaluate uh, early stage companies that, that, that are pitching you. Um, a lot of first time founders will ask for an NDA to be put in place. Um, and that's usually not a great sign. Um, it, it's a sign that they, they don't really understand the investor ecosystem very well. Um, if they are in a highly IP sensitive area, like pharmaceuticals or chip design or something like that, I, I have some understanding. But if they're largely just doing a consumer startup, then um, that may not be the best idea. Uh, if you see a startup that wants you to invest in them and their vehicle, that the, the corporation is structured as something other than a Delaware C corporation, that's kind of weird. And so you're probably going to want to talk it over with a, with, with a lawyer. Um, big red flags are if these are in uh, special tax jurisdictions like Seychelles, Bermuda, et cetera. You may, as an investor, find that you have surprisingly little protection if something goes south or if there is fraud or anything weird like that. The good news about Delaware is that everybody has sued everybody in Delaware. So Delaware corporate uh, law and Delaware shareholder law is incredibly well specified. And so it has much less risk in that sense. Um, so I would really uh, encourage, uh, even at a very early stage, if you're investing in, uh, in a corporation, it, it should be a Delaware C Corp, right? And there should be a very, very good reason uh, why, why it's not if it's not. Ideally, startups are innovating in their core area of business and are not innovating on trying to have radically differentiated back offices. That's, yeah, usually a little sketchy. Um, one, one, one thing to flag is that um, it's pretty easy to claim that you filed a patent. Uh, if you want to file a provisional patent, you just need to go and write up some shower thoughts and send them out to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office along with like about a $100 check. They will put it in a drawer. Nobody from that office will, will ever read it. Um, and you have no enforceable IP rights. But you can say in a pitch deck that you filed 14 patents and that sounds super impressive. Um, but really all it's done is it's start a, started a one-year timer for that company to actually file real patents, which can take three or four years to fully prosecute and register, <coughs> at which point they will then be issued patents, right? And so patent pending actually means very, very little. So if you see that in a deck, you can just dismiss it. Uh, if somebody emphasizes that most of the value of their company is in those patents, um, Again, it depends on the industry, but I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in it. If they have patents issued, then th that can be very valuable, right? So I, I don't want to be dismissive of patents overall, but patent pending means very little. Some flags for you as an angel investor. If you're an angel investor, you're probably not a professional investor. This is probably not your full-time day job. As a result, you have to think about what potential conflicts exist between your current day job, uh, what you do for a living, and doing this fun investing on the side. And it'll be really important both for you and your employer to avoid any real or perceived conflicts of interest. And so if you work at a hammer company and invest in a hammer startup, um, that's probably not great. If you're, you work at a hammer startup, invest in a toothpaste startup, then hey, that, that's probably fair game. What if you work at a really big company like Google, where I happen to work for right now? Google's probably working on everything. For all I know, there could be a project researching new kinds of toothpaste in Google X. I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of such a project. Um, does that mean I'm prohibited from investing in a toothpaste startup? And, and the answer to there get, gets a little bit more nuanced. And, and it, it has to do with the, uh, whether or not my day job involves exposure to confidential materials that could influence my decision to, to invest or not invest in that company. Um, and the, and the d d degree to which information could be perceived to be leaking either from the startup to my employer or from my employer back to my startup. So the safest thing 
is to invest in things that are well outside of your day job. If your employer covers a lot of different areas like Amazon, Google, Apple, etc., then uh, if it's a subject matter that's far away from what you work on as part of your day job and the proprietary information that you have access to as part of performing your job, that helps avoid a perception of conflict of interest. One of the other things that helps is if you have an arm's length um, relationship, right? So if you're not going to be uh, potentially deciding on that startup as a vendor, right? Um, that's, that's, really, uh, that's really helpful. Um, if it's a passive investment, if you're not taking a formal board seat or uh, an advisory role or anything like that, these are all things that help frame it as a passive investment that minimize the likelihood of conflict of, uh, of interest. Another thing, especially as you start building a portfolio of startups that you're investing in, is to consider portfolio conflict. What's the degree to which uh, you're investing in competitors, right? And what's the degree to which you could be perceived uh, that you're leaking information from one to the other. Now, obviously, I shouldn't have to say this, but I'll say this. You should keep confidential information confidential. You shouldn't share uh, confidential information about an investment with your employer. You shouldn't share confidential information from your employer with an investment. Like th th That's going to get you in a lot of trouble if, if you do that uh, either way. Um, but there's the matter of the reality of respecting confidentiality and also perception of making sure you're not put in a position where somebody believes that you're uh, leaking information on, on one side or the other. So one is to have a clear policy um, where, where you're going to uh, set up what's called a Chinese wall between uh, different different efforts, right? And, and there's a more conservative version of that where you are uh, just not going to invest in direct competitors. Now, sometimes you invest in two companies that seem like they're in different spaces, and then one uh, the, the, those lines of businesses may change. One company may pivot to be in the same line of business as, as another company. And at that point, the best thing to do is just um, make those investments more passive, right? So if you were on the board uh, of, of one, maybe to uh, step down from that, et cetera. But I know, don't be a jerk. <laughs> the Karma Bank is real. Uh, how do you value startups, right? Um, and, and the terrible answer here is that there aren't good answers, right? It's not as simple as just like, oh, you just take a look at their realized revenues and their, um, their acquisition costs and their channel costs, and you run a Black-Scholes analysis on it with a five-year projection, and you get X dollars, and that's how much to value the uh, company at. Um, that's pretty much bullshit. So most of startup valuation is, uh, is, a, is a fiction. Um, but it's a collective hallucination, much like uh, what do we perceive the value of one US dollar to be, is a collective hallucination that, that changes uh, over time. So it's helpful to see what is the collective think, right? So I would say if you're talking about something where it's one guy in a garage um, and the, the concept seems promising and there's an early prototype but no customers, something like two to $3 million valuation makes sense. If you have two or three people and you've got some early customers who are using it and there's something that's really built that's beyond a prototype, something like five to $7 million valuation makes sense. If you've got a team of uh, uh, five people who are highly specialized in their area or, or 10 people who are um, reasonably technical uh, in terms of their background and you've got some interesting revenues, you know, more than 50K a month coming in and growing at more than 20% month over month, 10 million to 15 million makes sense. So you start getting a sense for how to go and, and value these things. You also see that there are certain things that are going to be uh, bumps on a, on a valuation, right? So uh, receiving investment from uh, Y Combinator, for instance, is a big um, bump up in, in valuation for people because it's... Uh, it, it's collectively determined to be such a, uh, a mark of quality. Anyhow, um, so truth be told, it's, it's mostly made up. You need to look at, is this startup going for a big market? Are they likely to be able to get big margins in that big market? Um, what are the most likely things that will derail them? Um, and a big killer for a lot of um, first-time startups is just they're, they're, they're going for a very small market or they have very uh, unrealistic expectations about uh, the rate at which they can penetrate that market or the margins they can get in that market, right? Uh, and that's going to, th that, that needs to lead to lower valuations. One thing that can be hard for a first-time founder is 
when they read TechCrunch or similar publications, talking about small teams of, say, machine learning experts raising rounds at tens of millions of dollars of valuation for their first formal round, wanting the same for their company and just not having the there there to go and support it. Uh, if you're not yet comfortable valuing startups, that's fine. Again, just uh, follow in those rounds and you really want to find a, a competent lead investor and not just let a first time founder make up a random valuation that's not going to be uh, supported by the market. Cool. Um, in terms of evaluating whether or not to invest in a startup, do you find yourself excited by the opportunity? Does the pitch make sense? When you explain the pitch to your spouse, your significant other, um, or do you find that they get excited about it too? <coughs> Um, do you have enough technical uh, competence in the area in which the startup is, is going to be executing that you understand uh, whether or not the startup has actually built something meaningful and built it in the, in the correct way? Do you feel like you can explain uh, the implementation to a technical peer in a way that the technical peer says, ah, that's very clever, that's very witty? Um, is the team hustling? Are they moving quickly to iterate the offering they have out there and, and are learning uh, around it? Or are they failing to follow best practices? And do they think that they, with just one big splashy release and maybe a release party that they can achieve fame and fortune and their job is basically done at that point? Um, one interesting one is understanding what motivates the team. Why are they doing a startup, right? And this is particularly important because a startup is not necessarily a rational thing to do. If what you're looking to do is maximize income, you should probably go work for Google, for Facebook, for Amazon, Netflix, for any of the fang, right? Um, and, and so the fact that they're doing a startup says either they're unemployable. They couldn't get a job at one of those bigger places, which is a little bit of a flag. Although I'll note that like the WhatsApp founders who sold their company to Facebook for uh, many billions of dollars were both rejected from Facebook. So, um, but there's some reason beyond just uh, finding a safe way to make money that motivates the team to do a startup. And as part of your job as an investor to figure out what is that reason? Do you believe that reason? Does that seem motivating enough that they will be able to go and grit through the really hard times that are ahead? Because startups are brutal emotionally. Right? I've, I've had friends uh, kill themselves because they identified their self-worth, their reason for being with, I'm the sort of person who creates very successful startups then their startup hit a really bad speed bump, and their startup's not successful, therefore I shouldn't exist anymore, right? This really terrifying kind of mental space to get into. And you wanna make sure that the uh, founders have got the uh, presence of mind to be able to grit through the tough moments, but also to stay uh, removed enough from it that it, the, the up and down of it do doesn't drive them crazy, right? So how do you be a great angel investor? So there's a lot of things that, um, that you can do that may seem small to you um, or may seem obvious, um, but a lot of people don't do and are super helpful. So if you see news articles about a competitor, uh, about a potential customer opportunity, about underlying technologies that could help a company, about potential acquirers um, that you think is relevant, go forward it. Go forward it to the CEO, right? Worst case, they've already had 10 other people forward it to them and they're flattered that you thought of them, right? You're not going to really annoy them. Best case is they hadn't seen it. And you can provide part of that extended network of sort of sensors that are out there seeing what's going on in the world that lets them make better decisions, right? So it's a really thoughtful thing to do to just for everyone in your portfolio, uh, for each one of those companies, always be keeping a look at what's going on that, that, um, that they would want to know about that could potentially help the CEO and forward information and your thoughts about it uh, to those folks. If you have new ideas that are not related to uh, your, your employer and your, your day job, uh, share those ideas uh, with the companies that you've uh, invested in. Be willing to go and sit down with them and go and, and have a jam session where you're thinking through some of the hard problems that are facing their company right now in ways that you might be able to help them. Um, brag about them. Another very easy thing to do. Companies often will hit really cool checkpoints, but not really know how to celebrate it. And being part of their cheerleading team um, can help be a big emotional boost and uh, a point of encouragement for them. If you're out there blasting out on social media um, the different ways in which the, the startup in your portfolio is, is doing really well, that feels really good. And it can be helpful for attracting uh, investor interest in later rounds, acquirer interest, customer interest, and uh, employment interest for people who might want to work at that company, right? 
making a point to go out of your way to introduce them to potential channel partners, acquirers, customers, or other portfolio companies. That last one's one of my favorites. It's like, is, is when uh, companies in your portfolio, you introduce them, they start working together, right? It's a really good feeling as, uh, as an investor. Um, and my highest qualified deals come from companies who are already in my portfolio, right? Because they know what I'm looking for. And their job is often to interface with other companies that are in that that space that I invested in. So they're, um, they're full time looking at uh, different interesting technologies and companies in those spaces. So when I get referrals from uh, founder CEOs who are in my portfolio, those are, are hands down the best qualified leads that I get. So just letting them know that you're interested and soliciting from them a new investment opportunities can be really powerful. There's a lot of ways you can be a terrible angel. Uh, don't do these things. Uh, leaking uh, your portfolio company's confidential information to uh, other other parties, uh, basically taking action on their confidential information without their knowledge uh, or consent is, uh, is bad. Don't do that. Um, Sometimes uh, sketchy angels will ask for special retainers, so to be paid thousands of dollars a month uh, in order to lead their deal, and they won't disclose that to other people who are participating in the round. They'll demand uh, special equity in addition to the equity that they're getting from uh, performing the investment. That's sketchy stuff. Don't do that. Stay away from that. Um, there's lots of ways that you can kneecap a startup um, if you if you have a right of first refusal, ec uh, exercising it to uh, prevent a company from getting sold when they want to sell, uh, sell the company, uh, demanding that uh, the management go and sell a company when they don't want to sell and they want to keep it going forward. Um, all these things are like kind of bad faith uh, things that you can do as an investor. Don't do them. Um, if, if you have a convertible note, calling it and demanding that the company pay you the cash and interest, um, trying to take over the board or micromanage or effectively try and operate the company, um, just back out of the investment at that point. You're not going to do a better job than the CEO of operating the company, right? Um, in terms of your overall strategy, uh, some people, I've seen this mistake made, uh, start start getting involved in angel investing and they don't talk about it as a portfolio strategy with their significant other. Then their significant other finds out later and that's like a really awkward conversation. So you don't want to do that to your relationship. So if you have an SO with whom you are sharing finances, sit down, uh, talk with them about the possibility of having angel investment be uh, something that you want to get involved in for the next uh, 10 years or so. Talk about it as part of a, a portfolio strategy and asset allocation strategy of allocating five to 10% of your net worth. Um, and, and then setting aside some money as well for pro ratas. The companies that you invest in that do really well are going to have up rounds where you're going to have an opportunity to exercise your pro rata, put a little bit more uh, good cash after good, and maintain your, your ownership percentage in those companies that are doing well. Um, there's a number of long form studies that show that pro ratas are actually one of the ways that uh, angel and early seed investors end up making most of their return. So something to think about. So your goal should be to build a basket of startups, ideally on the order of 30 startups. And, and you can be patient about how you build that up. It's not like go do a big sprint and try and find 30 startups to invest in right now. Pacing yourself to invest in three startups a year for 10 years is something that you can achieve. Um, that's less than one startup a quarter, right? And so that's a kind of pace that you can get into and just make uh, as a part of your, your annual planning um, and, and annual activity. And then you want to be the sort of person that people want to get an investment from. Somebody who's friendly, somebody who acts in good faith, somebody who helps startups and provides a lot of value for startups that are in their portfolio. Be that person, right? People talk way more than you realize. There, there is a karma bank in Silicon Valley and you want to be putting deposits in there by doing useful things for your community. Um, AngelList has a thing called syndicates. Uh, the, what this is, is that a given angel investor can commit to uh, investing their own personal money into a round. Other angel investors can um, soft commit, so it's not a hard contractual commitment, uh, to go and participate on the same terms as that syndicate lead. Um, the syndicate lead themselves does not get paid a management fee. So the two and 20 we talked about earlier in terms of venture investors, 
the syndicate leads do not get paid a 2%. They do get paid carry. So it's pretty common that there'll be a 20% carry of which 5% goes to AngelList as a thank you for running the platform and 15% will go to the syndicate lead or leads. And they can, uh, if there are multiple leads for a syndicate, they can decide among themselves how they want to go and, and split it up. AngelList takes a fixed fee um, for a typical syndicate round, they'll take an $8,000 fee. Generally, they don't like that fee to be more than 10% of the total investment, which means that uh, you can't raise a uh, smaller than an 80K syndicate round on Angelus. They don't want you doing it. Um, so that's usually how uh, an Angelus syndicate works. Uh, it's relatively low overhead. They um, take care of pretty much all the back office for you, so you just got to click a couple things. There's uh, a new thing that AngelList has started doing called syndicate funds. And this is where instead of deciding on a per deal basis what you want to invest in, uh, you can commit to uh, investing in a set of companies um, that is uh, picked, that is selected by a syndicate lead. Right? And so what will happen in this case is the syndicate lead will raise in one go a couple hundred thousand dollars for a set of future not yet determined companies. And then generally they'll have about one year to go and make investments along that thesis. So it's like raising a micro fund effectively. Um, similar uh, to the regular syndicates, the uh, syndicate lead does not get paid any management fee. So it's only their money going out. They don't get any money in uh, for doing the investment. Uh, and they do get paid carry. There's a somewhat larger fixed fee, but then that gets amortized across all the different investments that get uh, made out of the fund. So it can actually end up smaller on a per deal basis and can make the economics around cutting even a 50K check uh, make sense when it's one of say uh, 10 checks being cut out of a 500K syndicate fund that you're raising. Um, the upside of that is you know, lower overhead and also uh, immediate exposure to a basket of startups being invested in. Uh, the downside is that you don't get any particular control over which individual companies you're going to get invested in by the syndicate fund, uh, but it's an interesting vehicle. Now, there's also crowdfunding that's out, uh, out there. Now, the best money that a startup can ever get is actual customer capital, people paying you cash in exchange for goods and services, right? And that's what a business is and what a business does. And sometimes if a company gets very, very good at fundraising, they can get confused about who their customer is, right? And the VC effectively becomes their customer and they get very good at pitching uh, the company and receiving capital in exchange for pitching the company. But that's not actually a company. An actual company identifies a customer need that's out there and figures out a way to get paid for it, right? <laughs> it's, it's very basic, but that's what businesses do. So if you can get uh, funding via pre-orders for your business, that's, that's pretty great if you do it right. And so Kickstarter has been a, a great example over the last couple of years of this because totally non-dilutive, right? Customers doing pre-orders don't get sh to be shareholders. They don't get special rights and privileges. They don't get rights of first refusal. Um, all they have is a right to actually receive the good for which they have paid you money. Um, the careful thing to manage here is how much money, right? And so in particular, if you're doing a hardware Kickstarter, if you um, do pre-sales at $50 a unit, and, and you think uh, naively you could manufacture the unit for 20 bucks and it turns out it's going to cost 200 bucks, you're in a world of hurt if you just raised a successful Kickstarter. This is super common for uh, hardware Kickstarters. Um, so really be, you got to be careful um, that you really understand how much it's going to cost to go and make and support this, this thing in scale. So it's, that's another uh, case of a success failure, right? Every business is a money printing machine. And um, if you don't know what the economics of that are, but are committing to certain economics, you can end up on the wrong side of that curve. Um, and that's happened a lot with Kickstarter. But if you are confident, you know what it's going to take to develop and the time frame it's going to take to develop it. The best money that a startup can get is, is um, pre-orders. Right? Customer money is the best money. ICOs. Um, thankfully, I, I, I actually uh, last year needed to go to further length to describe what ICOs were and why I thought you should avoid them with the plague. 
Thankfully, the crypto markets have now spoken and caught up with my excellent advice, and it's super clear now. Stay the hell away from these. Uh, many of them have been found to be unlawful, and the SEC is going to start finding people and throwing people in prison. Don't be one of those people. Don't do an ICO. Don't participate in an ICO, right? Um, again, I'm not a lawyer, but this area is... Um, actively being litigated. And unless you are really excited about being on the uh, frontier of securities law, I would just steer, steer clear. There's also so many fraudsters in this area who haven't been able to develop um, the, the, the fundamental premise of their coin, I have been found to be engaging in pumping and dumping. Um, just s stay clear, right? Um, that's my advice to you for Uncle David. <laughs> um, in terms of deal flow and evaluation, um, one good way to start developing your spidey sense on this is to watch other people invest. So join an angelist syndicate and see how they're evaluating uh, what to invest in and what not to invest in. Um, and I said it before, but I, I want to say it again, that the best way to develop a network is to be useful. Some people think of, so when I graduated with a degree in computer science, I was an engineer, I loved coding, and, and I, I shuddered at the thought of networking events and people who network, because it seemed like a bunch of slimy people handing each other business cards, right, which is just so uh, useless, right? And then what I found out is that there are people who do that, and those people are generally bad at their jobs, right? Um, the people who are good at their jobs are people who are always looking at the folks around them and finding ways to help them, to actually be useful. And word about these people spreads, right? So that's how to do networking. Think about what kind of wacky skills that, that you have uh, and, and how to apply that, how to be useful to the startups that are around you, and word about you will spread. So um, that's that's a great way to, to, to start out uh, getting your deal flow. Plant a flag, like I was talking about. Have an opinion about what's happening in the world and what's not happening. That'll mean you don't invest in things other people are investing in. And you got to just like not worry about what are called the type two errors, where you missed an opportunity to invest in something. You turned an investment down and ended up going to the moon. If you kick yourself about that, you're going to be staying up all night all the time, right? Um, conversely, um, if you have a controversial opinion that turns out to be right, you can end up on, uh, you, you can end up very handsomely benefiting from that, right? When I was proposing putting together uh, Mexican VC, a lot of people I explained it to looked at me like I was crazy. They were like, why would you invest in a place like that? There, there's crime, there's drugs, there's rule of law, like people are getting shot all the time in Mexico. And, and, and I would turn things around and say, that's actually exactly the reason why I want to invest in Mexico is because uh, nobody else at, at the time in Silicon Valley was, was taking it seriously as a market. About 150 million people, uh, household net worth has been climbing quite a bit. The economy is doing very, very well. A lot of Americans' assumptions about Mexico were very outdated. They're sort of looking at things from a 1970s, 1980s point of view about where American household wealth was relative to uh, Mexican household wealth. And with the middle class kind of bottoming out in America and, and real wages for the middle class having been flat for the last 30 years, um, that that gap has been narrowed very considerably. But most people didn't see that. So they, they had this sort of uh, racist, outdated uh, understanding of that market. And the fact that I was able to see that there were high quality founders, that there was a high quality market that was available there, uh, enabled me to get really outsized uh, returns, right? And so if you can see what other investors don't see, if you have a, a, a hypothesis about what is true and what is becoming true in the world that is not commonly shared yet, uh, with with the rest of the industry, that's awesome. You know, I think the flip side of that is that um, it can be dangerous to just sort of pile on a hype cycle to invest in what everyone else is investing in, even if you don't really understand it, and the hopes that it goes up. I mean, maybe it'll be right, but more often than not, um, you, you, with greater fool theory, like you're you're the greater fool. Like if uh, something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, and if, if you can't, if, if, if there's a con job going on, like you're probably the one being conned. So I, I think you're, you're developing your own theses about what's happening with the world and then planting a flag around those is a great way to get proprietary deal flow and to get access to deals that other people aren't taking seriously right now. Um, like I said, reminding people that you're doing it and um, blasting it out there. Um, Acting as a thought leader, going and posting your thoughts about what's happening with the industry is helpful. And then here's a really powerful trick. 
is that if you convene people, if you bring people together to go and talk about an idea, about an industry, you get a lot of the karma points of any of the good interactions and connections that end up happening at that meeting. And it's not that hard to convene and not that many people do it. And so if you can act as a convener, you'll find that you have uh, almost unfair leverage in um, getting to know a community and, and in building a network, okay? In terms of uh, evaluating, um, it, really the focus is on cutting a lot of small checks uh, and not just going and uh, writing one or two really big checks. You also wanna check your biases, right? Um, you wanna invest probably less in people who are, are like me, a, a cisgender, straight, white dude who was a product manager at big companies and um, went to Stanford and got a CS degree because lots of other people are going to want to invest in that. And so you're probably not going to get super crazy, interesting uh, returns. But conversely, if you find people who are being ignored, um, folks who uh, are from a minority, uh, female founders, you actually look at the stats and they are disproportionately more likely to succeed, but they're also much less likely uh, to get venture capital or to get angel investment. And so if you can be one of the set of people who backs those folks, um, you'll, you'll end up with an outperforming portfolio. Um, so but make sure to control for your biases and not just try and look for people who, who smell like what you think successful founders should smell like, um, but, but to really assess the, the idea um, and the, the earnestness and the technical competency of the team for what it is, not based on the, the, the gender, the orientation or the background, the skin color of the, of the founding team. And focus on the product, right? Does, does the team really understand the problem that they're solving? Ask them to describe it to you and see if like you feel enlightened about the problem. I love learning about problems from my portfolio company and when they can describe a new industry I don't know much about um, and help me understand the economics of it. Uh, I, I really enjoy that. And then you also want to look for a learning attitude from the founding team where they can project confidence about what they know, but also have humility to understand that their their understanding of the world is imperfect and that they're always hungry to learn more and continue iterating, right? So these are things that you look for in an employee, you should also look for in a, in a founding team. And then on your side, it's really important to try and make a decision uh, quickly. Now, I know I haven't actually always held myself to this rule, um, and it's and it's been bad. Um, so I I try to hold myself to a bar now of making a decision quickly, um, and it's really helpful as an entrepreneur when somebody says uh, when somebody says no, and if they say a why they're not investing. It's really hard as an entrepreneur to just get lots of meetings where the meeting felt enjoyable and the investor said, this seems really neat, um, thanks for the update, but uh, checks never end up really materializing. So um, it can be hard to get that sort of uh, really clear feedback uh, from, from an investor pitch. And so be that good guy, be that good gal who gives the candid feedback about uh, why you're investing or not investing. And, and again, I, I fall short of this sometimes myself as an investor, but this is the bar that I, I try to hold myself to. Um, and then uh, finding other ways to get other investors on board, whether it's you know, friends, family, um, or you've got a syndicate of your own. That's a very helpful thing that you can do for a startup. Cool. Um, well, this has actually gone on for a bit longer than I anticipated. I may do a separate segment uh, later about uh, war stories and the like, but I'm going to uh, wrap it here for right now. Um, if you watched this video to the end and enjoyed it, you found it useful, please let me know. My email address is david at weekly.org and my Twitter handle is dweekly. Cool. Thank you so much. Take care.